It's Thursday night. You know what that means. It's time for Magic and Martinis. Please welcome your host, Scott Wills. You got the right place, baby. <laughs> Thank you very much. I welcome you guys. So glad that everybody is coming to join us uh, here tonight for a nice little roundtable discussion. It's always a lot of fun to have some time with friends, and uh, it's better than drinking alone is kind of what I say. And also that since we can't really be together in real time, this is about the next closest thing that we could have to kind of being with some friends, which is why that we do this each week is to have a few different people who are different uh, each week and gives us an opportunity to kind of sit around and chat with everybody. And it's great to always see friends who are here joining us right now that Hello, Mark and Sue. I'm so glad you guys are joining us over there from Driftwood, Texas, just outside of Austin. Always love to see you guys. I'm so glad you're here. And uh, Charles uh, Chuck Arkin, also uh, ready for the magic words. Yes, well, we're going to be saying a lot of words over here then this evening. And uh, Chuck has been our uh, treasurer for a long time with the uh, IBM on the board. And uh, that we also, let's see, yeah, Charles uh, Chuck is from, uh, from Cincinnati. And then also over from Austin, there we go with Susan. Uh, and Nick Lewin. Thank you guys so much. So glad that you guys are joining us. I love you guys. Uh, I sincerely do. Uh, everybody. And also uh, Scott uh, Christopher up in uh, Chicago, North Chicago, I think, actually. Uh, so it's always good to uh, to have you in here, Scott. Thanks a lot. And from out in uh, uh, the LA area, my good buddy and uh, mind reader who's sending good thoughts over here from his mind wires. That's Alan Gittleson. I appreciate you being here, my good friend. Thank you, Alan. Alan had joined us a few uh, uh, months back also. And from up in Michigan, Hey there, Harriet. Very good to see you as well. I'm glad that you are joining us uh, here tonight, and I uh, uh, hope your cocktail is uh, is nice and chilled. And if, speaking of Michigan, of course, then we've got John Custer, who's joining us again. Thanks a lot for being here, and uh, so glad uh, you're here. And Dale Rabin, that's uh, great, and he's joining us over on YouTube, which I want to remind everybody, of course, that you can watch us on YouTube. If you got that, you know, like a Fire Stick or something, an Amazon Fire Stick that you can watch on your big screen TV that you don't have to necessarily be uh, watching it through uh, through Facebook or through uh, YouTube on the on the small screen over there or on your phone. There are so many different ways that you can watch it. Lots of uh, stuff. Uh, there's Nick uh, over there. Uh, Susan's better half, or let me say the other half. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Cheers to you, my good friend. Uh, good to uh, have you over here then too. So I tell you what, we've got uh, three great guests who are joining us here this week, and I want to try to bring them in uh, quickly so we can get started. We have a lot to discuss. There have been some things happening over here this week that uh, are near and dear to all of us. And so let me get started with our first guest. And what I have decided a few weeks ago is to make sure is to, rather than trying to introduce them verbally, that I think that I can kind of give their credentials better by some of the things they do by letting you actually watch a little video. So here's our first guest. Mr. Doug Anderson. Doug Anderson. Doug Anderson. Doug Anderson. Doug Anderson. 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 Get ready for a wonderful woman. Please, I can make it disappear. We have here one See there? Oh. So it comes loose. <laughs> 60, 80, 100 dollars. Oh. Oh. Because he knows he put his finger in there a full 12 seconds before I did this. Oh. <laughs> There he is, the man with the plan, the man from Oklahoma, and the man with the hat, but without the hat tonight. Hey, Doug. Can you hear hey, us okay? Scott. Can hear us? Uh, I can hear you great. Thank you so much for the invitation. And there you go. <laughs> I'm gonna take Cheers. Off it what are you drinking there tonight, Doug? Actually, yeah. uh, because we're working on... Uh, we're working on uh, packing up our trailer and stuff to head to California on drinking coffee. Well, let me suggest you just put a little bit of uh, uh, Irish whiskey in there. It's always a little bit better. <laughs> Only if it's Jameson. James, I like your thinking, my friend. Uh, let's bring in our uh, next guest, who is all the way from Washington, D.C., and this video will show you and tell you something more about him. 
Eric Henning is the premier diplomat of deception, enchanting Washington's elite at dinner parties, clubs, and banquets, and he can be the highlight of your next event. With multiple White House appearances and presidential inaugurals to his credit, Eric Henning is the capital conjurer, the politician's magician, and the most honest man in Washington. Invite Washington's most interesting dinner guest to your next event, and Eric Henning will be your secret ingredient to success. I'm Eric, I'm Eric Henning, the Wizard of Washington, and I'll make your next person for online, online event. event. Fun, fun, magical, magical and, and memorable. There is my next guest all the way from Washington, D.C., uh, the Washington Wizard. Hey there, Eric. So glad to have you here this evening. Happy to be here. I'm here with my buddy Elijah Craig, and uh, I've got the small batch in the glass. No ice. That's sacrilege. Um, <laughs> I agree. I uh, never drink some natural ready, ready to talk. You are the man. And the myth and the legend right there. And let's round out this uh, this uh, quartet over here. Since we happen to have someone who is in Washington, in our nation's capital, where the pre president resides, let's bring in someone who's actually a past international president, which is even more important because he's international. Uh, uh, this video will be showing you a little bit about one part of what that he does with uh, his business. Are you ready for a keynote that engages, entertains, and delivers insights to help you create exceptional experiences for your customers? Since 2001, I've entertained people around the world using the art of magic and mentalism. Amazing people is a skill that I've worked hard to develop and understand. So I combine all of that performance and psychology expertise with lessons I learned in my own management consulting career to help companies, associations, and leaders like you create amazing wow moments for your own audiences. Now this isn't smoke and mirrors. You get practical takeaways that show how principles from the stage, from magic, from theater, how they're applicable to the way you do business in the real world because ultimately we're all on stage. So contact me to find out how I can help you in person or virtually, and let's make some magic. All righty, and there he is. That completes us then right now, Mr. Joe M. Turner from Atlanta, Georgia. So glad to have you over here then too. Hello, Joe. Good evening, Scott, Eric, and hey, Joe. Joe. Good to see y'all. Uh, and Doug just faded out. I think he's coming back in here in just a second. So what have you okay. got uh, in the line of drinking? Uh, uh, tonight, uh, tonight we are just enjoying a nice Pinot uh, blended with a little Carmenier. So so it will blend right into your background, it looks like. so that uh, uh, A little bit, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah but that's not how he's going to make it disappear. No. <laughs> Cheers, my friends. Thank you all very much for being here then tonight. So this is great. So we do have a lot of people, again, in the, in the room, as I said, is that I know that uh, Steve Mills, uh, again, uh, he tries to be here as regularly as he can. Uh, good also from Brantford, Connecticut. That's just kind of up the road a little bit then from you then, Eric, as well. Uh, oh, a little more than a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of Texas, when You're we go across. In terms of going across Texas, yes. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, listen, as I mentioned to begin with, that this was something that is uh, – uh, unfortunately, kind of a, a difficult time for us uh, as magicians because we've had a, a pretty rough, uh, I started to say month or week or year, actually, I guess that we kind of look back on different people whom we have uh, lost. And it's been uh, very sad. And of course, that uh, many of us woke up here this morning uh, and hearing the sad news about our friend Walter Zaney Blaney, who had uh, who had passed. And uh, I wanted, to, before we kind of get into just some other things that just to uh, uh, get some stories and reminisces uh, with uh, some of you guys who are here then as well, um, that just to let you know, people um, have asked me a little bit about that. And Walter and I have been very close friends for a long time as a fatherly image, actually, for me and somebody. I, I was aware that he'd been ill a little bit. He had actually fallen this last week in the kitchen, and he laid there for about five hours before that uh, they found him, or rather he got up and then called Shannon, who lives across the street, his daughter across the street, 
they went to uh, ER. He was kind of speaking gibberish, you see, he got there. And once he got there, he kind of pretty much fell into a coma and he was having some uh, uh, issues bleeding into the brain. And so at that time, the doctor pretty much had said, this is going to be six hours, six months or six weeks or six months. It's, it's unknown how long that, uh, that this, uh, this might be. So it's, um, Kind of, uh, uh, not just kind of, it, it is a sad time, but uh, uh, he was someone who was uh, really great and had uh, affected and touched each of us in a lot of different ways. Who wants to go first as far as like giving some sort of uh, a little bit of a eulogy or some reminiscences that you've had with Walter? Yeah. Joe, you got something there? Um, I will say that I didn't know him well. Uh, I knew Walter... Uh, by reputation and by interaction at conventions, yeah, mostly he. I, I always think of his voice uh, as much as I think of his height. Uh, he had a voice that was as deep as he is tall, and uh, he was a, a striking figure. Uh, I remember a couple of times he would call me, uh, just ring me up, and ask me questions about something or someone that he had heard was happening in Atlanta or something like that. But I, I, we didn't have what I would consider to be a close uh, personal relationship, just a professional mm -hmm. one, a friendly one. And of course the latter levitation was one of those things I, I was envious of, but you know, other people having and performing because especially if it was, you know, correctly purchased. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yes. Uh, and in fact, that's one of the things he called me about one time is he had heard about someone in Atlanta doing like a pirated version and I didn't know anything about it, but I knew the people he was asking about. And so I was able to provide the contact information and let him talk to them himself and how that turned out. I don't know. I will, <laughs> I'm sure it was to Walter's uh, satisfaction, but uh, yeah, that was just, you know, brilliant. I love, I've loved watching all the clips that have popped up today. Right. On various pages and uh, he'll certainly be missed. One of just many giants in the, in the industry that we've lost this year. You know, one of the things that uh, I think of when I think of the two of you, that is Walter and, and, and you, Joe, uh, was when we were at a convention and I had recorded something for the podcast and this was uh, broadcast then later in which it was a story about uh, being on David Hoy's uh, radio broadcast and I have never in my life heard you nor seen you laugh so much, so heartily and from your, your, your gut. I mean, you were just, that was the funniest story you'd ever heard. You were just, you remember that, of course. That's been a while, but uh, I do recall you sharing that and you've shared other things with me in passing about your relationship with Walter. Mm -hmm. Being in Texas, obviously was such a big figure uh, yeah. in the world of magic there that uh, I, I guess I'm a little jealous of all of the the close ties that many of you were able to have with him. Uh, well, Atlanta has its uh, certainly its share of magicians. I've always thought of, uh, of Texas and Houston in particular as having a lot of some of the top magicians uh, around, but, and, and Walter, of course, being among them. Uh, anything that uh, you have to add over there then, Doug? Doug, did you freeze up? <laughs> Can you hear me? Doug Anderson, you're on. <laughs> hey, Scott. I think he's on connection. He's breaking up. I'm talking with me or not. Yeah. Give me um, a thumbs up if you want me to say something about Walter. Yes, I do. Okay. Walter was an incredibly nice, gifted individual. And one of the people that I always think of very fondly is Walter Blaney, his mentorship. And even, I think even my love of jalapeno peppers, I can trace directly back Walter Blaney to those he had at Luby's Run there in, in Texas. He was incredibly meticulous in every trick that he showed me, he would explain his reasoning behind it, why he chose it, why he did the different that he did. And he really was a, a very gifted inventor and performer. I asked him about show pricing and 
he told me how many for a show. And I said, is that for the Instant Texas Act? And he said, no, really, the Instant Texas isn't my bread and butter. It's doing simple tricks that everybody else does, the shirt pull, all sorts of different things. And I learned a lot that you don't have to go out and be completely unique to make a great living. And Walter certainly made a great living. And he put his beautiful daughters through school and doing magic. Walter is definitely one of my heroes, and he will be sorely missed. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I know also that you have a long relationship with the Blaney family, even going back way back when. I think that didn't you date Becky Blaney for a short time, even? I, I did. Yeah, I, that was uh, that was the one that got away because I was stupid. <laughs> I was young, and I used to drink a lot, and. I lost her. Becky's a wonderful lady, and I wish her all the best, especially yeah. in very trying time. Yep, yep, definitely that she is. Eric, did you know uh, Walter very well out in your area? No, I really didn't. I knew him by reputation. Um, I. It's really interesting to me to see the stories that are coming out now about the many kindnesses uh, that he did in private and never never trumpeted, never, never made a big deal out of, but he apparently had a tremendous influence on a great deal. I've never been an illusionist. I've never done the really big tricks with making people float or chopping people up and all of that. Um, because, uh, well, I got some advice and based on my style, it just wasn't a good fit for me. It's never has been. But I've always admired the people who do that well, who are very few. And Walter was one of those. I, re I remember seeing him on The Tonight Show, which is a clip, in fact, that I posted on, on my Facebook feed recently. Yeah. And just his total, um, it's interesting. I watched Lance Burton posted a, a, a segment from one of his specials, from the On the Road special. And it showed, and Lance was doing the zany, uh, the Blaney levitation, the, the ladder suspension, uh, on the beach, which is right. really a tough, a tough thing to do because you got no curtains. There's, I mean, there's nothing there. You've got no place to hide. Right. And, and I watched Lance do it, and I watched Walter do it, and he – and Lance clearly learned it from directly from Walter, and he understood because Walter did everything exact for a reason. You can look at every motion, every muscle that he moves, everything he says, at the moment that he chooses to do things. It's you can tell it's all been meticulously laid out, carefully planned, and polished through decades of real world experience in front of real audiences. And so Lance was, is of course, smart enough to realize he's not going to improve on that particularly. And so he did it exactly the way that Walter did it, except, you know, in, with a Louisville accent. Uh, and so uh, I, that when you see a master like Lance saying, yeah, I'm not going to improve on this. I'm going to do this is the way to do it. That tells you pretty much everything you need to know about Walter's um, incredible skill and ability not only to invent magic, but to perform it. Uh, that's great. That's a very nice eulogy. Appreciate that. There are so many stories that I have uh, with Walter, uh, one of which that three things that you reminded me of, but one I just want to quickly tell over here. And that was whenever that I bought his illusion uh, and hoop and everything. And my son, Sean, uh, had gone over there with me. Uh, he was uh, living here at the time. and. It was just uh, uh, amazing. I, you know, we had actually. <laughs> this was what was funny is that we had gone to the, uh, um, uh, gone through the whole thing. He took uh, all the time that it needed in order to show me how to how to set it up with uh, uh, everything, and then tear it back down. How that it worked. He showed me videos, and then he personally showed us, and then he put it in the boxes. Told me how to pick it back out. But we were there for probably at least three hours, I guess, as far as this instruction goes. So we go outside and get ready to put it in my car. And got them all in these big cases. And we're starting to go back out to put it in. And I'm driving a, uh, a Sebring. I think it's a Chrysler Sebring or something. And he says, well, well Scott, where, where are you going to put this? He sounds like Jimmy Stewart, you know. <laughs> where are you going to put this? And uh, I said, huh, hadn't thought about that. So he said, well, I'll bring it to your house tomorrow. And so he put it in his van. He came down, dropped it off at the house. So I ended up buying a PT Cruiser 
which fit the illusion exactly. I had two inches to spare on both sides and six inches on the front and back of this thing when I put the all the uh, the things in there. So <laughs> he said, that's going in the book. <laughs> <laughs> that this is something that uh, it was amazing. This guy actually bought a car to fit the illusion <laughs> kind of a thing. But anyhow, uh, Walter was an amazing guy uh, in, in so many ways. And I enjoyed the times we had together. We'd get together for lunch. We used to be once a month when he'd come down uh, from Kingwood, which was just north of town and everything. So anyhow, um, I, I know that uh, several of us, that uh, Joe, as the uh, as the past president, uh, but not only as a past international president, but you have been extremely busy. Uh, we're talking about some virtual things. Uh, one of the things that people kind of like to know what's going on uh, with with us then right now. And you actually just finished something today and then got back just in time for this broadcast. That is true. I mean, all of us are learning virtual, but today I concluded, well, actually the event was yesterday and I drove home today to be here back here for this. Um, a conference that was originally booked as a keynote live for the conference. And they didn't cancel when everybody else was canceling. They kind of held on. I was so grateful <laughs> that they did. And then as the spring wore on, they said, well, we're going to plan for hybrid. So there will be some people there, but we're also going to have to live stream it. And then a couple of months ago, they messaged me and said, we're still doing everything. We're still going to have you have you speak but the whole thing is going to be virtual. And a couple of things happened really within the last few days. Within the, Well, one thing happened about two weeks ago, and then one thing happened Tuesday night after I was already uh, – this was – the thing was the conference was being uh, all virtual, but it was being streamed from a specific set in Jackson, Mississippi. So even though all the talks were going out virtually – the whole conference was st all of the speakers had to, that they wanted to ha have speak on there on that set. Right. So I went over there to do it that way. A couple of weeks ago, they said, we're going to cut your keynote from 60 minutes to 30 minutes, which is a, a huge difficulty. Yes. Every speaker knows it's much easier to do 60 than it is to do 30 and and try to fulfill I, I, it takes me 30 minutes just to clear my throat are you kidding me? <laughs> and but then they said but what we want you to do is use some magic in some of these transitions earlier in the conference earlier that morning like an mc would and i said well that's great now you're speaking my language because i really love that so I planned, even though it was virtual, there was going to be some interaction and on-screen chat capability and a few people in the room. And so I was like, well, that's fine. Tuesday night, I was eating dinner with my parents. We finished. I came home with them because I stay with them when I'm in, in Mississippi, in Jackson. And my phone rings and it's the client. And I've already changed to go to bed. And my client says, um, we've had a technical issue. And as we look at this, we're not going to be able to do the transition magic live. Can you come down here tonight and record them? Wow. So I got said, I'll be there. I jumped in the shower, changed clothes, and, and drove down to the hotel in uh, Jackson. And we shot a couple of uh, transition segments for them to use. I did them both in one take. I will brag on myself. Wow. I got one take on both of them and we were we were done but still i think that it's just illustrative the lesson for for all of us is that now that things are virtual people are going to expect even more flexibility from us to right. deliver what they need because from their perspective they think they're making it easier i think maybe oh well now you don't even have to be there it's going to be recorded well yeah but i don't have the live chat i can't I had to change my material and improvise scripts based on the new situation. So they think maybe it's going to make things easier because you're not really in front of the, the large audience. And maybe for real people, non-performers, that's less intimidating because you're not in front of 400 people or something. But for performers, that's the whole energy. And to be doing it just for the camera is a whole different skill that, that we've all spent this year trying to develop. So anyway, that's a lot of stuff from this week. That's true. Well, in addition to that, it seems like that if you are giving them a lesser quality product in terms of 
the production quality of your streaming video, they are that's hurting your brand because you spent your time trying to make sure that you are professional in everything that you do. And when you're working with an audience and you're feeding off of that audience, that it sounds great and it looks great and they love you. But then it's kind of like, Oh, well, the lighting is bad or what's he got in the background or it's cutting in and out or that, uh, or you're having to say, unmute yourself or whatever, you know, it just takes away from the, 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 the drive that you have. And as a result, it puts you, I think, in a poorer light unless you really have the production quality because people expect, they watch television, they watch movies. They well, expect this to be really I, professional. I don't know, Scott. I, I would have to disagree there and I'll tell you why. All right. I think that all of us are having to learn to be TV producers and we've had this period. I, if they watch television, they're going to see the Today Show and talk shows and Saturday Night Live and things, trying to do things virtually and looking terrible. The pros mm -hmm. look terrible because they're trying to figure it out. And the and the ones that have been able to go live eventually, like SNL, are, are so relieved and they're able to do what they do. So in fact, I don't think there's a higher expectation. I think people know we're not TV producers. We have to learn those skills. And I think we're gonna need to retain those skills. My sources in the industry, particularly for corporate events, are telling me that even after this uh, COVID crisis is over, 30 to 40% of formerly live events are gonna be online or hybrid events. So this is a, a bunch of tools we're gonna need to have in our tool bag going forward if we wanna make a living. But right now it's a gift this whole period, the last six or nine months, have been a gift where we've had the chance to learn this stuff and we haven't had to be good because the expectations aren't that high and everybody knows that we're trying to you know, kind of turn on a dime. So we've actually had the ability, if we've had the smarts and the wit, to take this time to learn this stuff and work on it and get it to be good. And there are people who are doing very, very well. Um, well you know, we look at... Um, I mean, there's some some wonderful virtual shows that are out there, like Carissa um, Hendricks. It's she's great. killing it. But yeah. I, but but I think here's the thing, though. Um, there we are seeing a return to live events. I did my first live in person event since February on October 30th. It was a Halloween uh, event at a very high end historic uh, Colonial Inn. That's a restaurant, incredible food, in it, called the Elkridge Furnace Inn in Elkridge, Maryland, and they had 40 people sitting at tables 10 feet apart. And, you know, you talk about flexibility. I had to provide my own platform. I had to, we had to flex. I had to big, piggyback on the DJ sound system at the last minute. There was a lot of stuff going on where we had to be really, really flexible and, and, and kind of put it together. But ultimately it worked out great. I had to completely redo my show because it had to be interactive without people touching anything. So if did I you just ask people from the audience to say, think of a card or? I did, there was a lot of stuff, a lot, a lot of radio magic, a right. lot because I have a face made for radio, but it's, there's a lot of, yeah, call and response kind of stuff. There were some, what I call display tricks, things like the linking rings and half died ha Hank and things that we all know. Right. But there was some original pieces and there was one piece where they did have to touch the props, but it was legitimately a set of props that had been sealed in a Ziploc bag since the previous October. Wow. Because it's a Halloween theme piece. Right. If, if I could jump in, I, what I want to say is I, I understand the point that Eric is making as well as the point that Scott is making. Um, I think that it's great to aim for the high quality production and right now the, the benefit is people appreciate and relate to the authenticity of the fact that it's not 100% perfect. It's and, gritty and authentic. <laughs> and, 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 and so that I think is, is great, but I, I do think that he hit the nail on the head and I, I see Martina in the chat talking about like it's gonna go away fast. I, I think what we're gonna see is this return to live events but there's almost always going to be an expectation of a virtual track. And just like many conferences in the past would have content-based tracks, I think we're going to see a delivery track that is going to, people are going to expect that they can participate virtually in some way. I'm seeing it in national speakers association, local meetings. I'm seeing it in large conferences. I just, I think that, it, it's not going to ever go completely away. And right. it also is going to raise the bar for when you do have a live event that you want high attendance at, you better darn well have something exceptionally interesting 
as yeah. part of your lineup to justify everybody flying there. 100%, Joe, you're completely right about that. And of course, we are always aiming for the best quality that we can that we can produce, always, always. But we do have this opportunity here where we can take a little bit of time with the learning curve. I'll tell you, there's one, one type of event that's probably going to stay hybrid uh, for a while where the immediate family's in the room and the extended family is um, scattered around watching online. And that's mm -hmm. our mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. Yep. Um, there, that has been, the hybrid event model has been extremely successful with bar and bat mitzvahs because- How does that work? The family, well, because there's <laughs> sometimes there's a little bit of resentment with people having to fly in for somebody that they may or may not really know. You, oh. Your old college roommate has to fly across the country for your kid's bar mitzvah that they've never met, but it's a family obligation, so you have to do it. Um, and so now it's like, okay, those folks can all watch online. There's no air travel. There's no hotels. There's no hauling the whole family across the country or whatever. Because what happens is you have people who grow up together, and then they disperse. People go to different places for different jobs. And then when the kids are 13, they have to come together. I think it's, we're less, we're going to see less of that. You know, we're seeing some of that with weddings and wedding receptions, a little bit less of that simply because the pull of being there is so much stronger. So are you saying that there are going to be more people who in the future, as well as right now, will be attending those kinds of events, whether they're going to be weddings or bar mitzvahs or bath mitzvahs uh, virtually? in addition to the live event, so they'll have something on a screen? Right, so the, then family, the immediate family and the performer is in the room, okay? So I'm doing a parlor show for 20 people who are socially oh, distanced. Okay. And then they, we've got somebody, and this is where we all need to have our tech people. There are TV production people and movie production people who are out of work who would love to work huh. with us on our Absolutely. Zoom Absolutely. And run the room. You, I, in my, I can't. Some people can. Alex uh, Romero is great at this. I can't run the room and perform at the same time. It's impossible for me. So, um, yes, and, and Phil Ackley says, I, that means I can mute the team shouting out, I know what you did. But <laughs> only if you're on a seven-second delay, Phil, that's talk radio. <laughs> but, you know, maybe you can do that. But you have somebody in the room who's running the Zoom room, who's making sure, and you can have a two and three camera setup, and you can really – uh, make that work, but the performer is in the room, so you've got all the interactivity that you want, and then you've got these people watching from the sides, kind of like the Roman Coliseum or whatever. That that model, and corporations love it because it's safer. People aren't going to get sick, and it's much it's much less expensive. But there are events where people have to be in the room, and so people are going to realize you can't just do all virtual. You've got to have some live events. I think you're going to see people thinking very carefully about how they how they choose to go. And that's why in our marketing, we need to talk about live in-person events. The way I term it, they're all live events. Yes. yes. In-person events, there are online events, and there are hybrid events. And if you look, go to my new website, capitalconjure.com, C-O-L-R-O-R, -O -R, <laughs> uh, thank you very much which is the prototype for the eventual The Wizard of Washington uh, site. Uh, you'll see I'm, I'm advertising on a live in person, online and hybrid, you know? And there's some great things about online. I will throw away out with murder. Eric. You can get away with stuff you can't do any other way. And you know, everybody's got the best seat in the house. The, the live thing is true to an extent, but what I've learned as I had to do just this week, is that a lot of the online events are not 100% live, and we can all go down the list of the virtual events that we're being that we're seeing now produced and sold, and they're not necessarily se selling it as a 100% live event. All of my virtual stuff is 100% live until until yesterday, when they had those two clips that they interspersed at other parts of the event, making but, it a hybrid kind of a thing. Yeah, but some people are producing basically a television show that is partly live and partly pre-recorded and they're using the pre-recorded clip to allow them to switch out the set or the, the <laughs> it's not i don't think it's a secret no i know I'm just joking. if you're switching to an outdoor location and then so i mean i think it's pretty obvious so i don't cool. think i'm giving anything away 
no, no problem. No question at all. It's, you know, it's funny at Washington magic, uh, Washington magic.com on the internet. Um, which was a great show by the way, that you guys recently put on. Well, what we did was this was, this is a dinner show that we did live once a month. And the reason we did it once a month is because people were, I'm the only full-time pro in the group. We had David Morey, who's a political consultant, who's elected 19, I'm sorry, excuse me, 20 heads of state worldwide. And, um, uh, John McLaughlin, former acting CIA director, and Savino Rossini, who used to own the best Italian restaurants in Washington for 30 years. Um, so they're in between the other things they're doing. They're doing this once a month. And then I'm, uh, and Tim, not just pants, you got to wear black underwear in case the pants rip. Very important tip, <laughs> uh, pro tip. But the um, uh, but what we did was we had 18 months in a row of, of monthly sold out dinner shows at the Arts Club of Washington, which is a beautiful, it's the old James Monroe Colonial Mansion. It's spectacular. But we couldn't do live shows in person anymore. So what did we do? So we could, we all sat down and we came up with a plan. And the plan was we're going to use this time to put out content. We're still going to do a monthly show, same dates. But we're going to do it virtually online. And we're going to, the goal is to build, it's going to be free. And the goal is going to be to build our email list so that when we are back at the arts club, there will be so much demand. It'll be the toughest ticket in DC to get. Mm -hmm. And we've so far, we've added hundreds and hundreds of people to our email list. Um, and we've done four or five of these monthly shows. The last one was on Halloween. And what we do is everything's pre-recorded. Each person pre-records a three to five minute segment in their home studio or whatever, wherever. And then our, our video wizard, Mike Newton, puts it all together. But the thing that's interesting is we never say that it's live. We put live in quotes. We say virtual online magic parlor show. Half the people in the audience tell us they think it's live. It's handled beautifully. And because the, pre thank you, and because it's pre-recorded, our production values are so much better because it's not Zoom. It's, you know, 4K video. So we're, our production values are much, much higher. And what that does is that builds our brand in our market. One of the things uh, also I think uh, that I'm using as a benchmark was the Academy of Magical Arts. They did a fantastic job with this year's banquet uh, of having some live, it appeared to be live, and uh, some recorded things then as well that were very high quality, great lighting, and everything was perfect on that. And uh, that really, as I said, was the uh, the hallmark of of uh, the professional kinds of shows. You guys did a great job with that also. You got, you say you do that once a month then also then, Eric? We've been doing it monthly, roughly. We didn't do one in August because that was when the political conventions were. And I don't know if we're going to do one in November because <laughs> apparently the campaign isn't over. Um, uh, so we're, we'll see. I was wanting to do a Thanksgiving one. We might just skip it and go to Christmas, which will give us more time to do stuff. But one of the other things that gives us the ability to do and you don't have to be part of a team to do this, although it's fun. And you can have guest stars. Phil Ackerley, by the way, out in the Bay Area in San Francisco, does a great show every Saturday night. Oh, he does. And it's different with every guests. week. He's got different guests. I love Zoom. the show. It's on Zoom and it's with guests. And that's a great way to do a show where people aren't getting sick of just one performer there. But pre-recording some stuff is very, very, very helpful. And you can do shows that are just promo where people can see you and potential bookers can see you. And uh, that's very helpful. And one of the things we've done is we've posted on the website, we have all of the uh, recorded shows for people to view. And so I just put that link on my website. People are like, where can I see you perform? Well, here's what I've done for Washington Magic Online. Boom, there you go. And that'll, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's a good idea. And uh, also one of the things that I would like to do if I can get, I think that Doug Anderson is going to come back in here in just a minute. And when he does that, I want to ask, because Doug, you were a cruise ship magician traveling for a lot of years and also working in theme parks and in working in uh, theme parks. Uh, I know you haven't done that. In fact, you you wrote the book on theme parks, literally uh, on that. And uh, you probably haven't done that in years, but I'm sure obviously that that market has changed dramatically, as have the cruise ship industry. And you were working that for decades then also. Would you like to address anything on either one of those uh, on the markets? Or did you freeze up again? <laughs> sure. I and I apologize if I'm breaking up. Uh, can you hear me okay? If you can, please. I can hear you. Uh, yes. Uh, 
we can. But he's frozen up over there. <laughs> I was hoping that he would be able to uh, come on and talk with us a little bit about uh, theme parks and everything. As I said, that he had written the book on uh, theme park magic and then also had done uh, uh, a lot of cruise ships. But uh, looks like you're completely frozen up. Can you hear us at all? Okay. Try I guess turning off the video and just doing audio. That might help with the bandwidth. That might help a little bit then too. This is a... Uh, uh, a different kind of stream that we're uh, using over here um, than right now. Uh, Phil, by the way, had replied, <laughs> uh, yeah, we like his show, but yeah, they'll probably get sick of him. I don't think so. Uh, Phil, no. it's something that's uh, completely different. Um, uh, than Phil is well. like the Johnny Carson of online uh, shows, man. He's great. He understands when to be in the front and when to let the other performers go uh, uh, into the forefront. He plans the shows meticulously. He supports the performers Fun, really, really well. I mean, I can't say enough good things about it. It's a fun experience. And one of the things that's great about it is, you know, if you're not sure about doing your own online show, you can guest star on other people's shows. You can be a special guest and do a 10 minute or 15 minute chunk and get that chunk polished up and then put those modules together to make your online, your Zoom show. You know, that's a very good idea that you've just uh, pointed out there that if you are not comfortable in doing some sort of virtual show, if you just do two or three things that you can put together, there are a lot of lectures. There's so much content that's out there then right now that you can watch this, uh, uh, the, the content, get some ideas for, because everybody has a couple of virtual tricks that you can do where you kind of go out of the camera angle or uh, viewpoint or whatever and pull up something else or whatever, drop a coin. There are things that you can do certainly. And so I think that you're right, that uh, uh, if you just practice a couple things and you're comfortable with that before long, and then you're on someone else's show because these people like Phil are looking then for uh, uh, different people uh, to come on and kind of uh, be on their show. Um, and so uh, I think that it's uh, important to, to, to try to do something. All right. So uh, what do we got over here that, um, what are you doing then? I got a piece that I created called Monument. And Doug and Doug is back. So let's go to Doug. Okay, Doug, uh, take it away. We were talking about uh, theme parks and cruise ships. Can you uh, talk about either one of those as to where we are currently? Okay, with the uh, with the cruise industry, unfortunately, the government edicts are going to stop the uh, cruises from going. Crew members that work in the dining room and uh, the bedroom stewards uh, generally are four people to a cabin. The new regulations say only one person to a cabin. So if that's the situation and they try to get a cruise to go, there are certain numbers of people you have to have, the, the captain, staff captain, all the engineers, the safety office engineers, all sorts of different things that's going to suffer the dealing with the passengers. And unless they have one-fourth of the passengers cruising, they're not going to be able to get by with one-fourth the personnel. And they can't build more cabins uh, you know, it's, it would be very, very difficult. I see cruises, unfortunately, would be a long time in coming back. I, I hope not, because I got a lot of friends that still work the cruise industry, and my heart goes out for them suddenly having absolutely nothing coming in. Regarding the theme parks, uh, the, the the information that I had at the theme parks, uh, you know, from doing it for quite a few years for Paul Osmond Association. Yeah, come in. Uh, has played through attractions. I'm, I'm, I'm still alive. Hi. I'm on the air. This whole information Why? that I going to bed and learned while working cruise ship came into play as well. So I, I don't know if there'll be a whole lot of interaction happening with cruise ships. No, no. You can, I, 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 I certainly off. think that it's going to come back. And I think there is a pent up demand for live entertainment. For for theme parks, you think there's going to be a or or for for cruise ships or both? I, I think for both, people love to travel, 
And I think there's going to be a demand for both. I think theme parks will have an easier go of it only because it's easier to social distance and you don't have, right. have to have a whole uh, a put a, a four to a cabin. So I think any kind of regulations are going to have to take them into account. You're allowed to put more people back into a cabin. Uh, or, or they're, they're going to suffer just because of the lack of personnel that they are allowed to have by government. That's something that doesn't apply to theme parks. And you think that that's going to be something that uh, now I know that your book on theme parks had to do with uh, just the U S but do you think that's going to, let's say apply to, I don't know, let's say Disney world in Paris. Or Tokyo. And I think Alan's right. You win tonight's steering contest. <laughs> and I. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, that's not. Um, but I was listening to what Joe. Well, the, uh, the, the Wi-Fi out there in, uh, <laughs> in the hinterlands of Oklahoma apparent, appear not to be as great as they are in the hinterlands here of Texas. <laughs> um, but uh, anyhow, uh, so, Joe, I was going to ask you, by the way, and I'm going to have Steve Bragazzi on in a few now. weeks. Who is, uh, oh, you can hear me now? Uh, Doug, go ahead. Yes. So my, my question, Doug, was do you think that would apply to Tokyo, Disneyland, and Paris as well? Okay. Uh, Joe, you know, back to you. That's going to depend on those particular governments and what they have to say. Uh, uh, Steve Marshall, I know, has been working at the park out in uh, Japan. He might be a per good person to get and ask him about it. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so, you know, uh, hmm. uh, so my question back over here, <laughs> I'm sorry. I had someone who was actually texting me over here then too. Uh, Joe, I was going to ask yes, you about uh, being the uh, past international president. Uh, now, how have meetings changed? We were talking about, uh, conventions changing and things that you're doing right now virtually. And so how are the IBM and the FAM meeting? I assume that their board meetings are virtual since uh, as well. And some companies, some uh, groups are having uh, conventions virtually then as well. Yeah. Um, now I, I want to say I have been fortunate to be able to do some live and in-person events, even, uh, even during the summer. Uh, the odd thing would come and go, and a couple things that are still live on the calendar. But the virtual tool, it's just another tool. It is absolutely indispensable uh, for the IBM right now. Uh, our board meetings, our conference, our, the, the board meetings we would normally have had at the convention, we were able to do through teleconferencing. The uh, Our local IBM and SAM assembly, IBM ring and SAM assembly. We've been having monthly uh, meetings online as have the most or, or certainly many other uh, groups, but it's certainly not just magic. I mean, teleconferencing has been an important part of corporate just operations for a decade and a half, maybe, you know, depending on high speed internet availability. Uh, but I, I know many of my clients I would go into their office in Atlanta, but do meeting planning with them and personnel in other parts of the country all on video conferencing. So it feels extremely new and this undiscovered country for performers, especially the solopreneur performer, which most of us are. But I think a lot of our larger clients are very acquainted with it. They haven't had to do all of their events this way, but they are learning that they can. I think it's inevitable 
that the cost savings for doing things that way is going to have an effect on the way they do planning for the future. Productivity for working at home did not go down as much as people expected. In some cases it went up. So I, there's going to be a transformation of the conference industry and meetings, both for corporates and for clubs like ours, for events, for the way things are produced. We will see theaters continue to experiment in this space, even when they can put people in the theater again, because it is the nature of the artist to explore the new medium. So I just, I, I think that it's, it's one of those things that it's just a skill. We're all going to have to learn, just like we had to learn to do email and we right. had to learn to create websites and we had to learn that we weren't going to burn VHS tapes and send them out anymore or even DVDs. It's just another uh, change in the operating environment and those who adapt will succeed. So really you see this as being something that's kind of forcing us into the situation where we may have otherwise been kicking and screaming and dragging our fingernails into this, but now, and I think over the last six months, there have been a lot of people who have been doing that certainly and trying to come into this who are not comfortable with, with this uh, virtual or digital type of, uh, of work and having the lights and everything else that you got yeah. to do and, and, and whatever. My clients don't care if I'm comfortable. Hmm. You know, I mean, they want it to be good and they want it to meet their needs. And right now, the way they can meet the most needs for the most people is to leverage new tools. And as much as I love live applause, it's in my interests as a business person to become acquainted with the ability to work in multiple environments. And I will always love the live theater. I'm a musical theater guy for crying out loud. Right. We can finish this and I'll go in there and play you some show tunes and we can have a, we can have a party. I love it. I love singing live, performing live, doing magic live, hearing applause live. I love watching performance live. It, there's no substitute for that. And it will always be that way. Human beings will always have that. But I do think that at least in the corporate world, if we want to pretend that teleconferencing is going to um, just sort of evaporate with the virus, I – Gosh, I hope that's true, but I don't think it is. No, I think that this is going to be something that's going to be with us uh, here to stay for a long time. And we, the sooner we get used to this, the uh, better off I think that we will all be. It's just, I, I agree that there's going to be returning, but I think that even when it does, this will be an additional opportunity that you can offer to your clients. And that I love the way the word additional has been my mantra. I mean, the word of the year was pivot and I have avoided it studiously because right. to me, pivot implies a change of direction. Correct. And I haven't changed my purpose in performing or speaking. I have added a lane to my freeway that is still going to the same destination, but the way that I'm getting there is, is now, and I'm enabling myself to do it in more, more venues. And I just, if it, if it goes down and all of the skills that I learned this year become less important, then that's just fine with me. But if the opposite is true and that it sticks around and it becomes a core part of conference and convention planning from now on, then by God, I'm glad I spent this year learning to do some things. Yeah, uh, very well put. Well, at the uh, risk of this freezing up again, I'm going to <laughs> bring Doug in here then as well. I don't know. <laughs> it looks like with your Wi-Fi ability over there that uh, it's have some difficulty. But have you thought then, Doug, also about doing some uh, virtual shows? I have, and I've talked to a couple of agents about it. Uh, I don't really prefer to do those. I do a lot of shows for church groups and a lot for senior citizens groups. The, the shows that I do really are teaching senior citizens how to avoid being scammed, and that becomes more of a live thing than a virtual thing. Right. And uh, it just seems 
to work better for me to do shows live. Yeah, I know some things that you've been doing over there. There are just a, a few things that uh, are from your lecture notes and things uh, in the past of uh, uh, that are available over there. But I know that you have been also teaching uh, these uh, people who actually are in the, um, the senior living homes about scams and how to avoid them. And uh, they, they certainly need that. Can you uh, talk about that for just a moment? Yes, and God willing, I don't lose the internet. You'll be able to hear me. And this was something that I would love for all the people that are watching your podcast. That's right now. Feel free to take this, uh, do it yourself. I, I'm not worried about, hey, that's my idea. You can't steal that. Please take it and use it. All I'm doing is I'm taking some some easy to do mentalism effects or the three shell game that my friend uh, Rob Sines, pastor over in Joplin, helped me with, and showing them these tricks and then going into these different scams that phone calls uh, people make to them. And it's amazing how, how much when you start to get into it and you talk about the 3 a.m. phone call that you get from the police station and it's your grandson, Billy, and he's in jail and please don't tell mom and dad and I need $300 to get out on bail, and you're already sending your credit card number to that person on the phone before you stop and realize, I don't have a grandson. Hmm. And the number of people that I talk with that, that have been scammed by that, I was doing a show over in Oklahoma City for a, a ex-cruise director friend, Terry Sue Vega, and a gentleman was there said, hey, what are you doing here? I said, I'm setting up to do a conference for a group of ladies. And he said, what on? I said, on having to avoid scams. And he said, this is completely unsolicited. Wow, I wish you had been with us several months ago. Our neighbor got scammed out of $1 million. And about Holy three cow. weeks later, another 800000 so there is money to be made doing these kind of scam schools. And there's also a great need to protect, especially our more, more, more vulnerable citizens. So all you have to do is look up the most recent scams on a Google search. And you put together a very simple show where you pretend that you're scamming them with body language or watching their, listening to their verbal cues. And, and take it from there. And it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a need that needs to be filled across this entire nation. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Eric. You had a comment over there, I think, then, too. Well, yeah, I, I'm actually the primary caregiver for my 88-year-old mother who lives with us. And so she watches all the old people network. She watches, you know, shows like Perry Mason and the Lone Ranger and, uh, you know, Little House on the Prairie all day long. And the commercials on these networks, even the commercials on these net cable networks are very, very, they're yeah. right on the borderline of being fraudulent. They're very deceptive. There are all these companies advertising uh, Medicare supplement or substitute plans, and they make it look like they're actually from Medicare. And then the disclaimers, we have a 65 inch TV. It's huge. <laughs> yeah. You still can't read the disclaimer. Right. It's too, it's too small and it's too fuzzy. And he's constantly saying, hey, do I need that? And I'm like, no, mom, you've got, you know, you're, you've got your covered, you're set, you don't need that. And she's writing wow. down phone numbers. It's unbelievable. And she's got, no, she's got short-term memory issues and she can barely see with cataracts. So it's, there's also thing, these car automobile repair insurance companies, many of which are complete scams um, that, you know, and I always look online for these things. So you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a very vulnerable population. And there are a lot of these businesses or so-called legitimate businesses that really um, use very, very um, sort of skeevy techniques to uh, get yeah, the response. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it looks like you were nodding your head there, Joe. You had a comment? You need to unmute yourself, Joe. I was just going to say that my parents are also uh, in their 80s now. And, you know, this is conversation that I... I have to have with them regularly that, you know, my dad is still really on top of things and making sure things are happening. My mom is a trusting person. 
they were raised that you know people in authority are going to tell you uh, good information. And if she sees something on TV or gets a you know the odd email that insists that something bad is about to happen, she, she you know there's a there's a population that will believe it and worry about it. And so training people to be skeptical of that is a very noble thing. Yeah, that's true. I'm sorry, you had something else and also to add there, Doug. Uh, yes, yeah, so if I could say one, one thing, uh, and it doesn't just apply to the elderly citizens. Some of the most easily fooled people are people that consider themselves very intelligent. And in several of the classes that I've been to, uh, they talk about a bank president that got scammed out of 300000 and he's still bank president because it was his own funds and not the bank funds. And our friend Tim Scarborough down there in Florida talked about to just the simple scam of people holding up a sign saying work a lady gave him a bag of food and he threw it behind a bush and he said i looked behind the bush there was a mountain of food they have food it's a scam they just want money and how to convince people our age who have good hearts who want to really help people out get them to understand donate to your church donate to the local uh whatever it is where you know it's an established organization and then direct those people holding those signs will work for food to that other local place who can tell the difference between a scammer and somebody that really needs help. Uh, yeah, there are places obviously that people can go if they seriously need the help uh, over there that uh, miss it. Always a difficult thing when you see someone who is on the street and who's begging, who's homeless, uh, holding a sign. Uh, and uh, yeah, I I know that there are some scammers and everything, but there's some people who legitimately need, ha, are in need then as well. Uh, yeah, Joe, you were going to say something? I was just saying, yeah, I, I, you know, I can't speak for other people. I, I have a highly skeptical nature about a lot of things, but I also try to listen to my heart in, sure. in the situations and, you know, on if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I'll be wrong in in the direction I chose for a good reason. But I I think that comes from the from a place of to Doug's point, being able to distinguish to distinguish on a pretty regular basis the obvious cases. Yeah, and if I make a mistake in the narrow range, then that's all that's my personal choice. But it I think it is critically important as we have an aging population in a glutted information marketplace to, to teach them to be uh, discerning about what they believe. Yeah, Eric, comment? Could I make a major announcement? Yes. Uh, I'm gonna be launching a new, you, some of you know my story and some of you know how I spent 25 years in the investment business. I do. Uh, going from an apprentice to a partner in a money management firm. And I retired from that partnership in 2007, right before the housing crash and the, and the, the economic crash, which I had written about about nine years earlier in my newsletter. Um, I don't sell investment products. I'm not licensed anymore. I don't give individual advice, but I still know what I know. And along these lines, I'll, the people I've talked to, real, the people need this information now more than ever. Um, and so I'm going to be starting a new YouTube channel called You Can Do Money. And it's going to be uh, as interactive as I can make it in terms of answering questions that people actually are asking. But I'm going to be talking in plain English about these financial things because that's kind of my superpower is explaining this stuff. Um, and I'll make sure you get you guys get notice of it. And Scott, you can um, maybe have me back on to talk about that at some okay. point. But um, this is going to be a really a very exciting project. Uh, it's going to end up being a YouTube channel, a podcast, Instagram, Facebook, eventually books and things like that. So, uh, yet yeah, uh, I'm pretty excited about it. That sounds great. Well, listen, uh, as we start to wrap up, this happy hour has made us happy. And there have been a lot of things that we've discussed that have been uh, very serious and some uh, lighthearted things uh, then as well. I want to thank everyone who's really been joining us uh, on this uh, program here this evening. Thank you guys. Uh, from so many different places who have uh, come in and given us your comments and your thoughts. And I appreciate uh, your 
uh, you're joining in and sharing with us uh, over here then this evening. And I especially want to thank my guests then this evening, Doug Anderson, uh, despite the problems over there that with, uh, with your connection, uh, also Eric Henning up in Washington, DC, and then Joe Turner over in Atlanta. Thank you guys so much, very much for, for being with us. This has been uh, nothing short of uh, fantastic again, uh, that we've been having, uh, today, by the way, of course, that, uh, what we're doing Thank here, you, Scott. uh, you're, you're welcome, uh, on the magic, on this, uh, pot, on this, uh, sorry to say podcast, uh, what we're doing here on this broadcast is really trying to supplement the podcast. And so what we do here is talk about things that are relevant that happen today and are important to us, uh, as we, uh, um, uh, as we go through life, uh, I guess, basically, and, and kind of uh, share stories with each other. So this way that we uh, know that it is um, uh, something that uh, each of us uh, uh, enjoy uh, talking with each other and, um, uh, and have to deal with all these situations. And so we kind of share that as opposed to on the podcast where we get an opportunity really then to uh, talk about things that are going to be just as relevant 10 years from now as they are today. Uh, and today, uh, this podcast happened to be released with Arian Black. And a couple things about that. One is it's fantastic. She talks about a new book that she's working on while she's up in Canada then right now. And, and that is uh, something that uh, uh, is about female magicians from the past, uh, which will be a coffee table book. It's going to be uh, a lot of photos and everything. So that ought to be very interesting. And then uh, also, um, she talked then about her career. Next week, we're going to be then talking with Randy Shine, uh, who is a, a, a fantastic magician. I heard his lecture here a while back, and he's uh, really good. And I know you guys are going to enjoy that conversation then as well. Uh, by the way, speaking of uh, of um, Arian Black, that she has Arian Black's Magic Kitchen on Facebook. So if you're watching this on Facebook, be sure to go to Arian Black's Magic Kitchen and to like that because it's something I think that you guys will enjoy each week that she has different recipes and that she shares as uh, this cooking class. Usually has about eight or less ingredients and takes about a half hour to prepare. They're really good yeah. and they're really delicious. And I've learned how, more about cooking from that show. That's right, way, Eric, You were actually on that. You'd and Ariane, Ariane also has, is a brilliant photographer so take, check out her Instagram feed if you want to see some absolutely amazing pictures from Vancouver Island, Canada. Yeah, uh, very good point uh, that she is someone who has, uh, uh, yeah, up in Vancouver that she had moved from Las Vegas to back to her home in Canada during this, uh, this crisis time then that we have. Uh, and as a result that she's been uh, teaching us some th some stuff from her kitchen. And tomorrow I'm going to be actually on uh, again as a return guest and talking about something that is going to be uh, what I, as, as cranberry relish, which uh, my son, Sean, uh, really loves. And I'm going to be preparing this for Thanksgiving and I'm going to make it tomorrow, freeze it. So this way, Sean, I can bring this up uh, when I see you for Thanksgiving. Uh, but uh, it's going to be uh, really good. And she's going to also talk about fixing some cornbread. So well, there'll be a couple of recipes then for tomorrow uh, that will be in tomorrow afternoon. And that's something that's sponsored by the Society of American Magicians. And that is 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you. I'm glad that you mentioned that then too. Yeah, because that's like three o'clock central time, my time. So uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, she's in Vancouver. Yeah, she is... Uh, a multi-talented person that, as you mentioned then right there, Eric, is that- She has more talent than a person should ought to have, a single person <laughs> should have, seriously. Yeah, she goes out each day in her kayak and takes nature photos, and she is just an amazing person. Uh, yeah, that's been great. Uh, well, it looked like that uh, Doug had to uh, sign off over there, but I thank each of you guys uh, very much again for, for joining us. Uh, Benny Slade, thank you. It was great. It was good to uh, have all of you guys over here on this uh, on this broadcast uh, here then again. Thank you uh, very much for your time. And that uh, and I hope that, uh, by the way, that if you have an opportunity to uh, help the podcast, all that you need to do is go to uh, the iTunes store and or to wherever you uh, listen to your podcast, give us a five star review and a little comment, something that uh, I mean, you got some time right now. So if you can do that, that kind of helps our podcast grow. So listen, thank you very much, Eric. You have been fantastic. I appreciate you being over here with us then this evening. And also then to Joe Turner over from Atlanta. Thank you so very much. This has been uh, again, just fantastic. And so I, I want to thank, uh, uh, Doug Anderson, he's not, he's already had to sign off. He's had some, some issues over here then this evening. 
And so until next week, uh, that uh, and we're going to be having somebody all new, and you'll be hearing about that then right now. So thanks again, and this is Scotty out.